Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 Summer and Tropical Weather Outlook webinar. My name is Andrea Berg, and I will be your host today. Um, before we begin, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. We are recording this webinar, so we will be sending out a link to the recording um, with everybody who registered uh, once it is available. If you're experiencing any technical issues, please contact me, the host. Um, it might show up as Benoit um, Hertel um, in as my name uh, through the chat feature. We uh, will have time for question and answers. Um, so if you use the Q&A feature on the right hand side of your screen and submit any questions you have, we will make sure we can get to them. So with that, I am going to turn the presentation over to Jeff Johnson. Jeff. Great. Thank, thank you, uh, Andrea, and welcome everybody. We have uh, lots of information to convey to you as we look forward to the 2022 tropical season. We do have, uh, first of all, three presenters, myself, uh, Nathan Hamlin and Stephen Strum will go over a recap of last year and our forecast for 2022. And then we'll be turning it over to another uh, group of panelists, um, including Brad Nelson, our uh, weather operations lead, and uh, be handling a, a discussion on various topics with respect to risk management. But um, our goal here is to try to give you some intelligent, intelligent and actionable insights uh, for the upcoming tropical weather season as well as the, the summer season. And uh, we're going to start off by reviewing last year and also some historical aspects of uh, tropical weather. We do believe it's important to understand the history of, of uh, storms and hurricanes as they impact the United States. Understanding the history is important to uh, put things in perspective as we go forward. Uh, we'll look at what influences are predominant for 2022. We'll compare that with uh, what uh, the models are suggesting may happen uh, this year and summarize that all in our tropical season outlook. And then we'll uh, provide some outlook uh, to the summer season, including temperatures, precipitation, and other impactful weather. And then we'll shift it over, as I mentioned, to a panel discussion to uh, talk about risk management. Uh, before we do that, uh, we will handle uh, some of the questions that you may have on on the upcoming forecast season. So first of all, I'd like to uh, start with a recap of 2021 it was another very active season in the Atlantic Basin. As you can see on the map on the right, all of the storm tracks uh, for the year are plotted. It was the third most active season on record. There were seven hurricanes that occurred and four of them became major hurricanes, meaning at least a category three. And there were eight storms that made a landfall in the United States. Two of them were hurricanes. Uh, the two hurricanes is just uh, a pitch above the average uh, annual uh, landfalls, but uh, we did have uh, six tropical storms in that total as well. So a uh, pretty, pretty busy year once again for the United States. Pretty uh, uh, costly year, $80 billion in damage. That's the third highest on record. And uh, also seventh year in a row where we did have a storm uh, form in the Atlantic Basin before the start of the hurricane season on June 1st. So uh, it does seem to be a, a recent trend here where we are seeing tropical activity developing uh, earlier than it, uh, than it used to, primarily due to the Atlantic and Gulf being uh, warmer than average. So going through all of those eight storms that hit the United States last year, we can start out with the June storm, tropical storm Claudette had maximum winds of 45 miles per hour. It did uh, make landfall in southeast Louisiana um, and uh, produced about $375 million in damage. And unfortunately, 14 fatalities did occur uh, as the storm moved inland. Rainfall was quite excessive. The little inset map on the lower right shows the uh, location of the rainfall from Claudette with the uh, heaviest total being over 15 inches in Gulf Corp 
Gulfport, Mississippi. The storm did also trigger nine tornadoes, uh, which uh, continued uh, uh, as the storm center moved inland. Now, uh, moving to our next impact of the year, we had Tropical Storm Danny. This was a pretty weak system, only winds of 45 miles per hour, and it moved westward into the uh, South Carolina coastal area, making landfall near Pritchard's Island. Very minimal damage with this uh, system, but it did produce over six inches of rain in a very localized location in extreme southern South Carolina, but pretty spotty rain, as you can see on that rainfall graphic on the lower left as it moved further to the uh, west. Now things got a little more active as we had our first hurricane landfall of the year in the first week of July, Hurricane Elsa moved uh, across Cuba and then up along the west coast of Florida before making landfall in Taylor County. The maximum winds uh, with this system were 85 miles per hour and a pretty damaging system, 1.2 billion uh, uh, totaled with this system. And uh, unfortunately, again, five fatalities. Uh, rainfall graphic to the right shows a, a swath of significant rainfall from Florida up the eastern seaboard all the way up to Maine. Uh, the highest rainfall total was a little over 11 inches at Punta Gorda, Florida. And we did have uh, quite a few tornadoes with this system. 17 of them from Florida all the way up to New York State. And uh, similar to a storm uh, last year, we did have strong wind gusts continuing along the eastern seaboard as the remnants of the system advanced northward. Uh, part of the circulation remained offshore and that allowed it to re remain a little more intense in terms of uh, winds uh, circulating with the remnants of the uh, system. And then we had a, another tropical storm uh, move up through the eastern Gulf of Mexico, Fred, uh, during the middle part of August. Maximum winds 65 miles per hour, so just a little below hurricane threshold. Made landfall in the uh, Panhandle region of Florida, another billion dollar plus uh, damage event and uh, more fatalities with this system, seven of them. And uh, again, a good swath of significant rainfall, especially from the Florida Panhandle up the Appalachians, but uh, all the way up into uh, New York State as well. Generally two to six inches of rain fell in those areas, but uh, over 10 fell at uh, Mount Mitchell in North Carolina. And again, pretty active with the tornadoes. 28 of them registered from the uh, southern into the central Appalachians region. Then uh, we had uh, another hurricane, Hurricane Henry formed off the East Coast moved northward and then made a turn to the west and uh, moved inland, uh, making landfall in uh, Block Island, Rhode Island. This was a track somewhat similar to Hurricane Sandy, uh, which did make that uh, big left-hand hook uh, before coming in uh, uh, years back. Uh, damage, uh, 700 million, two fatalities occurred in North Carolina, well away from where the system occurred. Uh, but uh, we did have some flooding that occurred in New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut, and uh, three minor tornadoes occurred in Massachusetts. And again, the rainfall graphic you can see predominantly was in northern New Jersey, northeastern Pennsylvania, into uh, parts of southern New England. Now, the, the big system of the year, Hurricane Ida, occurred in uh, late August through September 1st. This was a category four storm, re reached max winds of 150 miles per hour, and it maintained them when it made landfall in Port Virchon, uh, uh, Louisiana. A very costly storm, 75 billion, and uh, there was extreme destruction from those uh, uh, excessive winds as they moved inland across uh, Louisiana and portions of Mississippi. Also, some uh, flooding rains occurred, uh, the storm surge along the coast uh, caused damage, but uh, pretty high in the fatalities, uh, 96 of them. Uh, surprisingly, 57 of these were in the Northeast US, well away from where landfall occurred, and I'll explain that in just a little bit. Uh, there were 35 tornadoes uh, that were associated with Ida as it moved inland. 
and uh, flooding rains uh, did occur in a, in a couple of areas, one near Louisiana, the other one up in the Northeast. And in fact, there was catastrophic flooding that occurred in the New York City area as the remnants of Ida moved across that region and a, a, a flash flood emergency was issued due to the really excessive rainfall rates that occurred. And then also uh, seven tornadoes uh, occurred in uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey as the remnants of Ida uh, moved uh, through that region. Looking uh, first of all at the rainfall graphic, you can see the very heavy rains uh, that uh, were focused near the landfall in northeastern uh, parts of, uh, of uh, eastern Louisiana there along the Gulf Coast into northwest Florida. And then those rains trailed off there for a while, but then as the remnants moved northeast, we saw an enhancement as it interacted with the frontal boundary and uh, heavy rains uh, then picked up once again across Pennsylvania into southern New England. And then uh, we also had uh, a lot of tornadoes that occurred uh, in parts of uh, the Delmarva region up through uh, uh, southern New Jersey. And uh, then, uh, interestingly, looking at the fatalities with this system, that image in the upper right shows the direct fatalities associated with, with Ida. And uh, there were a number of them that occurred in eastern Louisiana and into uh, southeastern uh, Mississippi. Uh, but then we had another uh, fairly intense uh, concentration of fatalities that occurred across uh, New Jersey associated with uh, flooding and uh, tornadic activity that developed. Then the lower image there on the right side shows the indirect fatalities. Um, many more of them occurred in eastern Louisiana, uh, just a few of them with uh, tornadoes and flooding in New Jersey. But the reason for those indirect fatalities uh, were due to uh, carbon monoxide poisoning as people were using generators uh, uh, due to a very extensive long long duration uh, power outages where Ida made landfall there in New Jersey. So uh, even though fatalities uh, might not occur right away with a storm, there still are risks that occur well after the event has exited the area. Uh, then we had Tropical Storm Mindy, a little bit uh, calmer system in early September with maximum winds of 60 miles per hour, made landfall at uh, St. Vincent Island in Florida, mostly tree damage and one weak tornado and uh, rainfall much uh, less concentrated and less extensive as that moved northeastward. And then uh, middle September, we had Hurricane Nicholas that formed in the western Gulf of Mexico. That moved up and grazed the southeast uh, part of Texas and uh, made landfall at Sargent Beach, Texas with winds right at 75 miles per hour, a little over $2 billion in damage with uh, heavy rainfall and storm surge, mostly concentrated from southeast Texas through southern Louisiana into southern Mississippi and uh, parts of, of Alabama. Now, looking at, uh, at some longer term historical trends, uh, this is from a study that was put out a couple of years ago, looking at the number of landfalling hurricanes in the United States between 1900 and 2020. And then uh, on the right, the, the major hurricanes that uh, made landfall during that period. And uh, you can see there is a lot of annual variability that occurs, some years pretty quiet, some years uh, uh, maybe up to seven hurricanes that uh, made landfall in the United States. Uh, pretty similar story with the majors um, overall. Uh, pretty flat, even a slight down trend uh, over the last century. But I think one thing that's really interesting is that period between 2005 and, uh, 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 excuse me, 2007 and 2000. 15, where there were no major hurricanes that made a landfall in the United States, a very unusually quiet period, uh, maybe led us to believe that, uh, that the risks of majors wasn't all that uh, great, uh, but uh, things have really changed here in the last uh, five years or so, where the number of uh, major hurricanes has really jumped up again, uh, impacting the United States. So. 
bottom line is overall the average number of storms really hasn't changed much over the last century in terms of hitting the United States, but there is a lot of uh, variability that can occur over from one year to the next, and you might even have some quiet years and some really active years. So there is uh, no clear trend that we're changing you know, in one direction or the other. Another thing I'd like to point out, since uh, tornadoes were quite common and destructive with storms in 2021, is the number of uh, tornadoes uh, produced along the path of tropical cyclones. This is from a study, 1950 to 2007. All those dots on the map indicate locations of tornadoes that were spawned by uh, tropical storms or hurricanes as they moved inland or from the remnants of those systems. Very heavy concentration down there along the Gulf Coast and uh, southeastern part of the U.S. up into uh, Virginia. Uh, but again, last, last year we did have quite a few of them that occurred around New Jersey up toward the New York City area. So a little bit more of a northward push with those events uh, during uh, 2021 compared to that uh, previous lengthy period. Of about 6% of all tornadoes in the U.S. are associated with with tropical uh, storms or hurricanes. So not, not an insignificant number, but uh, something to really keep in mind as, as we saw from last year's events, the tornadoes can occur well inland uh, associated with the remnants of a tropical storm or hurricane as it moves inland across the US. And then another reminder, just how extreme rainfall can be uh, with uh, tropical cyclones as they move into, into the United States. These are the state rainfall records uh, associated with tropical storms. So uh, even up into Illinois, you can get up to 10 inches uh, from the remnants of a system. A real granddaddy of uh, rainfall events from Harvey in Texas with over 60 inches as that storm virtually parked for a few days and just dumped uh, on areas in the vicinity of Houston. Florida up to 45 inches, but even the Carolinas uh, uh, 25, 35 inches of, of rain. So pretty extreme flooding events can occur. And if you pick out your favorite location in there, you can see that the risks uh, uh, are pretty, pretty high as systems do move inland. So just summarizing some historical uh, factors uh, we did have a, a period of few landfalling hurricanes uh, in the decade just uh, completed. And that was the way out of line compared to the last 150 years of historical records. We had no major hurricanes uh, between October 2005 and August 2017. So that was a record span for uh, no majors making landfall. Since 2017, however, we have had five majors make a landfall in the US. And uh, even uh, a weaker storm or, or one with just enough intensity, uh, if you put that in exactly the wrong place, you can have pretty significant disrupt disruptions occur. Uh, so for example, uh, Sandy and Har Harvey, as they moved inland and weakened, they still uh, were able to create quite a bit of havoc, uh, even though they were at a weaker intensity. Uh, if the statistics, start catching up with uh, the 150 years of history, if those landfalls and intensities catch up, uh, the costs of, of these impacts will be greater because we've got a lot more growth in, in acreage in terms of uh, cities and population and a lot more vulnerability with the infrastructure. So uh, a storm maybe 50 years ago, if that came in today, it's uh, likely to produce a lot more damage just because of that uh, increased exposure. And uh, could see widespread pop property uh, destruction if, uh, if uh, a, a landfall occurs in an area of dense population and infrastructure. And uh, we're also noticing uh, maybe over the last decade or so that it seems like there's some trend for storms to slow down or stall as they approach uh, the US coastline, so that has maybe contributed to more excessive rainfall events with, with some of these storms such as, such as Harvey. So again, just keep in mind, uh, we've got a long history of hurricanes impacting the United States. So there are 
cycles that tend to occur, quiet periods, uh, active periods, but uh, it is going to be more costly in the future as these storms do impact our growing population. So at this point, I will now hand control over to Nate, who will um, give you some idea of, of what 22 may, may bring. So take it away, Nate. All right, thank you very much, Jeff, for that great information. And we'll go move forward with the tropical seasonal forecast. So let's, before, before we go there, though, let's talk about important seasonal factors. So uh, tropical development is enhanced when ocean temperatures are warmer than average, thinking of it as having more fuel for the fire, more fuel for these systems to use. Vertical wind shear, and what that means is, it, is we talk about changes of wind direction or speed with height, is weaker than normal. So when there's weaker wind shear than normal, winds are basically the same direction and the same speed from the surface all the way up through the atmosphere. When there's more wind shear than normal, there's either a change of direction or a change in speed as we get higher. And that is bad for systems as it tends to make them more disorganized. And large scale rising air motion is present. So if we have all three of these together, that is the best environment for strengthening tropical systems and uh, favorable hurricane season conditions in the main development region our main development region in the atlantic basin is from just west of the african coast to the caribbean sea so if we take the conditions that we just talked about and place them over the main development region you increase your risks of having systems develop there uh, a stronger and wetter west african monsoon can play into it as waves from Africa can come out into the Atlantic. If it meets those perfect conditions, you can have more development. So let's take a look at the main seasonal drivers as we always do in these webinars. And the first thing that stands out is a weak La Nina. And looking at the sea surface temperature anomaly forecast on the right-hand side for June, August, July, August, and September, See all those blues in the tropical Pacific west of South America? That's indicative of below normal water temperatures. That is our La Nina uh, display. And uh, looking at the Pacific Ocean north of there, see some warm water uh, across a lot of the North Pacific, but there's some cooler water that's tucked right up against the U.S. west coastline. So we refer, that, we refer to that as the negative Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And off to the right of the Atlantic, there's lots of warm water just about everywhere, and that is a positive phase of the Atlantic multi decadal oscillation plus AMO. So what we like to do is look in the historical record and look for years that exhibited similar water temperature profiles, and that can give us some clues as to what's going to happen next. Let's focus on ENSO for just a moment, and what you're seeing here on the bottom is a chart with water temperature anomaly forecasts in the ENSO region from modeling centers all across the world. There are many options you can see there. And there's only one road model that's even close to an El Nino and it gets up there and that's probably not going to happen. But, there's, but you notice there's a pretty good agglomeration either in the ENSO neutral camp or the La Nina camp. And the thick red line you see going through there is the average. So we're anticipating that water temperature will be right on the border between La Nina and Enso Neutral, and that's a favorable factor for tropical development. How does Enso influence tropical development? Well, let's focus on named storms, hurricanes, and major hurricanes since 1995. You notice uh, columns have since 1915 and since 1995. Let's, more, let's focus on the more more recent uh, period since 1995 and notice that and so neutral and La Nina can produce 16 named storms, eight and nine hurricanes and four major hurricanes respectively. Um, so they're pretty similar, but if you look at El Nino, it, it's less on all counts. So uh, typically you have Enso neutral and La Nina, that's a clue that you're gonna have a busier season. So let's take a look at analogs. And basically how we define that is average weather conditions from previous years with similar ocean temperature patterns that are expected this year. And we picked out our top six analogs there. We got a couple more in, the, in there as well, but these are the top six here to kind of demonstrate what's going on. And 
2021, the last year, year Jeff talked all about uh, that is one of our top analogs. If things look pretty similar as to you know, going into this year as they did last year. Some minor differences, of course, but similar you know, nonetheless. And then we have 2000, 2011, 2008, 1989, and 1956, respectively. And what you see in the bottom are the number of named storms, hurricanes, and major hurricanes of category three or higher that occur each year. So quite a number of these years, especially the more recent ones, have a large number of storms. And looking at some of the tracks, you can see a lot, you know, several of them did recurve. So they came out, a lot of them came out towards the, you know, from Africa and then towards the, through the main development region and then kind of recurved northward. You can see that in almost every year. And then there's some of them that showed up with some close in tracks in the Gulf of Mexico. And then uh, there's a few other ones here that came a lot closer to the East Coast. So those, that's kind of a thing we want to focus on here. But in any event, the analogs do show the potential for a more active season. So analog averages, 1991 to 2020, the historical average for the recent 30-year climatology, 14 named storms, seven hurricanes, and three major hurricanes. If you compare that to the 1995 onward neutral ENSO years, 16 named storms, eight hurricanes, and four major hurricanes, so more than the 30-year average, Let's compare all that to the 2022 analog years average and in all counts, it's higher than normal. 17.5 uh, named storms, 7.7 hurricanes and 3.7 majors. So analogs are suggesting a more active season. Let's take a look at the current sea surface temperature anomalies and everything we talked about in the forecast is mostly already in place. We don't have a lot of work to do, but the one thing you notice here is there's, there's even warmer water temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean and what's shown on the model gamut. So there could be some minor cooling that occurs in the main development region area. But the one thing, another thing I wanna kind of focus on is look at all that warmth in the Gulf of Mexico and right near the Southeast coast. And we usually have something like that. It gives these storms a little bit more fuel and then it gives them a little bit more of a chance to hold together as they approach the coast, which is kind of a concerning factor. So tropical parameters here. So, on the left, you have CFS forecast of temperatures, and on the right, you have the CFS forecast of wind shear. Focusing on temperatures first, it does show the idea of above normal temperatures pretty much everywhere. The main development region, maybe not as much, but still be sufficient for storm development. On the right, you have wind shear. So the blue is where they're forecasting below normal wind shear, and the orange is where you're forecasting above normal wind shear. And for a lot of the main development region into the southern Gulf of Mexico, you have a strong signal towards the low normal wind shear. That's a, fact, a favorable factor for development of storms. Now, right up against the Gulf Coast, there is an area of enhanced wind shear. And if that is true, that could be a limiting factor in storms as they approach the coast. So warm water versus a bunch of wind shear does it increase a little bit of the, makes it a little bit more difficult to determine how the storms are going to act once they get closer, but that is a factor we'll have to keep a close eye on with each storm that comes up through. Look at, let's take a look at the rainfall forecast for July through September, so most of the peak of the season from the ECMWF model. This is a three-month uh, anomaly, so you see those greens about the eastern half of the Gulf of Mexico through Florida and then up and down the east coast of the U.S. There's That means wetter than normal conditions, so the ECMWF is suggesting more rainfall than normal, and you know, that's obviously a concern. So, um, and no, so that um, lines up with the analog approach, thinking of more active season and more of a potential for landfalling storms. So taking a quick summary of the environment, a cold neutral ENSO forecast, or weak La Nina, is forecast and it's favorable for tropical development. Past analog years indicate above average tropical activity can be anticipated. Warm ocean temperatures and lower vertical wind shear is forecast for the heart of the Atlantic hurricane season. And you know that those are ideal conditions for development. And we have above average rainfall expected along the US East Coast and Eastern Gulf of Mexico, which enhances the landfall threat. So put it all together, uh, definitely have to be on the lookout for another active 2022 season.
So let's talk about the potential for landfalls here. Kind of gave it away earlier, but let's do it anyway. And that lower landfall period that Jeff talked about earlier, from 2006 to 2016, um, the, the predominant pattern here, and these are 500 millibar height anomalies. So you see the area of low pressure or the lower heights along the eastern seaboard, air tends to flow counterclockwise around that. So um, a, lot, a lot of times when the storms come uh, from Africa and then come through the main development region and try to approach the east coast, they're picked up by that flow and forced northward. So it had a lot more recurving storms and storms that got steered out to sea. Think of it as a blockade there. And the high pressure that was way up in, near the pole wasn't enough to hold it inland, hold it down so it could recurve. Looking at 2020, that was a very hyperactive year, the record breaking year. Notice that that trough along the East Coast wasn't really there. It's backed into the central part of the country. It had a strong area of high pressure just off the East Coast that, that kept that uh, actually acted as a blockade. So every time a storm came in underneath, it couldn't come north because it can't move through the high pressure system. And then as it approached that trough, it was actually steered northward. So storms came through and then they were steered northward into the Gulf of Mexico. And there were several storms that did that. So let's compare that to uh, what's going to happen with the analog average in 2022. And a couple features stand out. First of all, that trough along the east coast is back and that's going to increase the idea of recurving storms. And of course, uh, the analogs did show that. But there's a big high pressure system across eastern Canada and then off of the Canadian Maritime. So when these storms try to recurve, that, that kind of blocks their path out. So when that high, the high pressure is in there, there is a chance that even though the storm starts to recurve, it could be drawn, it could be drawn back towards the coast. A good example is Henri of last year. It did that. Of course, Sandy was another one later in the season. So, there, I mean, those are the types of things I have to watch across the northeastern part of the country. Now, that high is not going to always be there. So, once it does go away, the recurve can complete. When the trough of low pressure kind of goes away a little bit, maybe the storms could go a little bit further westward and impact Florida or the or portions of the Gulf of Mexico. So, there's a few potential activity or a few potential uh, places to go. But with the low, with the trough being right along the coast, that does protect the mid-Atlantic maybe a little bit more than usual. So in summary, stronger than average low at 500 millibars can be expected over the southeastern part of the U.S. And as discussed, this results in increased threats for systems to turn northwest towards Florida and the northeast U.S. coastline. You'll think of Elsa or Henri. They remain in the western Atlantic such as Sam. High pressure is forecast over eastern Canada. Um, the high could result in slow moving or stalled systems over the northeastern part of the country. Andre is a good example of that. So let's wrap this all up into the 2022 outlook and we're, this is going to look a lot like last year. Uh, 21 named storms we're going to go for, eight hurricanes and four major hurricanes. Again, our elevated potential areas of focus will be across Florida, westward through the Gulf of Mexico, and unfortunately for Louisiana, they are probably under the gun again. They have to keep a close eye on the season. And then the northeastern part of the country, elevated potential, not only for landfalling systems, but any of these systems that come in across Florida or the Gulf Coast can always, the remnants could always go up there. And that, as seen last year, can have some definite uh, impacts. So this is gonna be another potentially high impact season. We're gonna have to keep a close eye on things. Um, the only area we have slightly reduced risk uh, across the western Gulf Coast, north to Mexico, where we don't think storms are going to be able to get the, e the ECMWF agrees with that. The analogs do too. So, not to say one can't get through and impact the area, that could easily happen, but that's not our favored risk area during the 2022 season. Quick look at the Atlantic storm names. Um, all the way to Walter from Alex in a supplemental list, which I hope we don't have to use. So our key messages, real quick, conditions appear favorable for another active season. Model guidance shows warmer than normal water temperatures and reduced wind shear, both of which would be supportive of more tropical cyclone activity. Analog upper air patterns show Atlantic storms to be more favored to impact 
The Northeast US and the Florida region with reduced risk across the Western Gulf of Mexico, even a weaker system can have significant impacts if, if it strikes a more highly vulnerable location. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Strum and he's gonna tell us all about the summer impacts beyond the tropics. Take it away, Steve. All right. Thank you, Nate, and uh, thank you, Jeff, earlier on for giving us that background information on the tropical season. So now we'll kind of jump through uh, the other aspects of the summer season, looking at temperatures, rainfall, drought, and those uh, uh, areas as well. So uh, first off, starting with temperature, we are looking to see a hotter than normal summer, primarily across the middle part of the country. The Plains area in particular is looking to be uh, pretty hot this summer and really c consistently so from June right on through August, but the East Coast, uh, in part because of uh, more rainfall potential, uh, may end up averaging a little closer to normal. If we do look at that rainfall potential, you can see again, the Plains area in particular is the really the, the main focus for the drier than normal conditions as well as across the Northern Rockies, but the East Coast could be wetter than normal. And part of that will uh, of course be influenced by the tracks of hurricanes and tropical storms this hurricane season and certainly uh, you know, if we don't see any landfalls there along the East Coast, that would reduce the rainfall there. And if we do see a couple of major storms, or at least in terms of rainfall, uh, that would significantly impact the totals for the overall summer season. Now, historically, we have had a trend towards wetter conditions through the spring and early summer in recent years. And so if that continues this year and we do see more rainfall than expected across the plains area and the middle part of the country in general, into the early part of the summer season that could temper, temper the temperatures a little bit during the early part of the summer. And, and we may not see June come in as warm as we're, what we're currently expecting. And that may also have some impact on the uh, current expansion of drought that we're seeing that we'll talk about here in a minute. But first looking at some more temperatures here from a, a cooling degree day standpoint, we are looking to see uh, this summer again, hotter than average coming in about 6% higher than normal in a degree day standpoint. However, uh, that is largely because the core of the heat is focused across the plains and the Rockies, which are lower population areas of the country. And so if we do see the, sort of the same general pattern, but it's a little bit farther east than what we're currently expecting, it would then uh, impact a larger portion of the higher population areas of the eastern third of the country. And that would in turn uh, significantly boost the CDD totals for the country as a whole. So there is certainly a risk here that we will see these totals come in uh, a fair bit higher than currently forecast uh, just by shifting the core of the warmth a little bit farther east from what we currently have. So that is something to watch out for uh, as we head through the summer season. Now, looking at those drought conditions, again, those are in place right now, pretty much from the plains to the west coast and also developing along the Gulf Coast a bit as well. And those areas likely should stay in, in that drier uh, to drought conditions state really right on through the upcoming summer season. Again, that middle part of the country is forecast to come in drier than average. And if that does happen, most likely we will see uh, some further eastward expansion of the drought areas that are already in place. Uh, switching gears here to the uh, wildfire risk, obviously that is usually tied directly into the drought condition areas. And so uh, most of the uh, uh, plains and, and Western US will have an elevated risk for wildfires as we head through this uh, summer season, obviously, as conditions dry further with time through the summer uh, and the hotter weather acts to also dry out vegetation as we head through the summer, the risk for fires will increase and likely continue to increase as we head into the early fall months just beyond this window as well. So August and September would tend to be your higher wildfire risk months across uh, especially the interior western areas um, once conditions have dried further throughout the summer season. Uh, now, looking at severe weather, we have already had a more active than usual severe weather year to date. Um, we've had some uh, pretty large tornado outbreaks already here in the last month or so, and that likely will continue to be the case going forward. Typically, with these La Nina summers, we do tend to see more uh, severe weather than normal across much of the central and eastern U.S. And so, while we are going to likely see you know some breaks at times and, and not always see uh, an active pattern you know every week. Uh, likely we will see some additional rounds of active weather going forward here into June, and that should keep us above average in terms of our tornado totals here right on through the uh, uh, upcoming summer season. 
Now, uh, in part, that is because typically we do see a stronger than average jet stream across uh, the central U.S., kind of from northwest to southeast during the summer season, and as well as the spring season, when we have uh, similar conditions in place. And the enhancement of the jet stream aloft tends to also re result in those areas seeing more wind shear than usual. And that's one of the one of the ingredients you need to have uh, more severe weather and more tornadoes. And so, again, that will be helping to also feed into the severe weather pattern across the middle part of the country coming up here during the coming weeks. Now, in terms of where that severe weather will tend to be focused on the map here on the left, you can see for the balance of the spring areas from Oklahoma and Arkansas northeastward through the Ohio Valley will be. Uh, Looking at more severe weather than typical here coming forward here for the next several weeks. Uh, that's pretty much where you usually expect it during the spring season, uh, kind of in the heart there of, of uh, tornado alley, maybe a little bit farther east of there. But uh, as we head into July and August and September, likely again with that drier pattern developing across the plains, we should see a reduction in severe weather in those areas relative to normal. And so likely the pattern that we're, that we're looking at here is a lot of severe weather, more severe weather than usual across much of the central U.S., probably right on into the early part of June. And then we should see a sharp reduction take place as June progresses and then less activity than usual in the middle part of the country, um, but perhaps a little bit more than the normal along the East Coast as we had through the uh, second half of the summer season. But that will also, again, be tied into the tracks of the hurricanes and tropical storms this year, since we do tend to see a lot of that severe weather Kind of tied into the uh, uh, paths of the tropical systems as they head along the east coast like we saw with some of those storms last year now looking kind of in summary here across the us uh, across the west coast uh, the big focus will again be the already ongoing drought conditions in that in those areas and likely we will see uh, uh, some worsening with that as we progress through the summer season as is typically the case across the southwest so we are looking at potentially a more active than usual monsoon season, and that typically gets going you know, during the middle of the summer and progresses into the early part of the fall. So we may see a very hot pattern there during the early part of the summer, but then as monsoon you know, rainfalls in, uh, increase during July especially, we could see uh, some reduction in the intensity of the heat there, and that may provide um, some potential for a little bit of uh, easing and, and, and in the drought conditions in a few areas, but oftentimes, though, you do see an increase in lightning with the uh, uh, more active monsoon season, and the lightning in turn can spark off more forest fires as well. So it kind of is a, a balancing act there. You get more rain, but you also get more lightning, and, and that does tend to increase the wildfire risk, at least initially before at the start of the monsoon season before we do see uh, more of that rainfall accumulate. Across the plains region, uh, the focus will pretty much be on that hot pattern that should set up during June and then continue through the balance of the summer season, uh, resulting in an expansion of the already ongoing drought conditions. But farther east as we head towards the east coast, again, looking for more rainfall than average, uh, higher tropical risks than usual as well. And again, that may help to reduce temperatures there, keeping them at least closer to average relative to the warmer weather that we're going to be likely seeing farther west. And of course, along the Gulf Coast there, again, the higher tropical risks from Louisiana eastward and the increase in rainfall there may also, again, help to temperature or help to temper the heat a little bit, keeping conditions uh, closer to normal, but likely still running just uh, a little bit above average overall. Now, before we wrap up here, we'll do a quick look at the renewable forecast. We are looking to see more wind than average in those uh, kind of purple areas there across the central U.S. So uh, those uh, big wind generation areas from uh, Kansas southward into western Texas uh, should produce more wind generation than typical this summer season. So that will have an impact on uh, the power supply in those areas uh, during this upcoming summer, which again, we'll see likely a lot of heat. And similarly, as you would expect with the hot dry pattern across the middle part of the country, that will in part be due to the fact that we're not seeing a lot of clouds and rain. And so we should see uh, ample sun in those areas and that should help to uh, boost solar power generation as well across those areas. So, in summary, again, a warm to hot summer is likely across most of the central U.S., especially the eastern Rockies and the plains. The east coast may come in a little closer to average with the enhancement uh, of the rainfall in that area, helping to reduce temperatures uh, a little bit. Um, the dryness should lead to an expansion of drought across much of the western and central U.S., and that in turn will be increasing the risk for wildfires as we progress through the summer season. So it could be another very active wildfire year across the western half of the country. 
And again, the uh, wet pattern across the East Coast will present that risk for, uh, especially during hurricanes uh, in, in larger rainfall uh, systems like that to produce some enhancement of flooding risk for the East Coast areas as we progress through the summer season. And severe weather should remain higher than average this year. And most of that will likely occur between now and the middle of June before we do see things uh, kind of level off a little bit. Although again, each of these landfalling tropical systems when they occur will again bring that threat for an enhancement of severe weather across the Eastern US as well. And so at this point in time, you should be seeing a poll pop up on your screen. And so please take a few minutes to uh, answer those questions. And right before we go over here to our panel here, led by Rennie, um, we'll see if we can take uh, a few questions. We don't have a lot of time, but we'll take maybe questions here for three or four minutes. And uh, Nate, have we had any questions roll in that we can answer? Yes, uh, we have had a couple roll in. Um, let's start with this one. Would warmer SSTs along the East Coast be a predictor for close in development? Uh, I'll take that one. And the answer to that question is yes, it would. Uh, warmer temperatures along the East Coast would allow storms to remain, strong, to remain stronger, longer, closer to the coast. If the, if the water temperatures were cooler, a lot of times that'll act as a drag and cause systems to weaken here, but we're not expecting that to be the case. We're expecting the warmer sea surface temperatures to play in. Now, if you have above normal wind shear along the coast, that will tend to weaken systems most of the time. So that is a counter to that. So it's a little bit more uncertain than usual, but with the warm water temperatures, you always have to keep a close eye for these systems to stay strong. And let's see, if any others come in? Oh, well, I think being 46, I think we have one, uh, one question is probably good for now. I think we should move on from here. Thank you very much for the questions. Hey, and any other questions that you do post in the Q&A, we can try to answer uh, by text there. And also uh, we can uh, try to answer those by email after the uh, webinar is concluded uh, later today and in the upcoming days. But with that, we can go ahead here and pass things along to Rennie, who will lead us through our panel discussion. Excellent. Well, we really appreciate that information from Steve and Jeff and Nathan. And no doubt it's going to be an active spring and summer, uh, but we are excited to talk about today how to handle these risks as they may appear um, coming forward and, and how as a business to prepare for those. I am really excited to be joined by Brad Nelson and Andrew Polk, uh, two exceptional risk communicators and meteorologists that have worked in a variety of industries. Brad and Andrew, how are you guys doing today? Rennie, I'm doing great. It's good to be a part of the panel and, you know, discuss, you know, some of the, the, you know, kind of how to prepare for what we're likely going to see as an active uh, tropical season. Yeah, I'm doing great as well. Thanks for having awesome. me. Yeah, absolutely. So, Andrew, I'll kind of start with you. It, it sounds like it's going to be another active tropical season. Last year, we had 21 storms. This year, we're predicting 21 storms and kind of a somewhat of a repeat of a pattern anyways toward that we saw in 2021, uh, we're expecting in 2022. How do you anticipate that that's going to affect various businesses um, as we go into the hurricane season uh, this summer? Yeah, I think the the impacts uh, can be wide ranging. Um, you know, right now from an outlook perspective, we are looking at the central Gulf of Mexico as a slightly enhanced risk for um, a more active season here this upcoming year. And with the addition of, uh, you know, 21 tropical storms here in our forecast, uh, that can put quite the strain on the Gulf Coast, uh, but also on any offshore operations that, that occur in that region as well. Uh, it also goes well beyond the offshore industry. Uh, it also reaches into the live event industry and the utilities industry, uh, especially along the U.S. East Coast, as we also have an enhanced risk in that part of the United States as well for this upcoming season. Absolutely. So if you're a business that's kind of in some of these target regions, which is essentially along the Gulf Coast or Eastern Seaboard, what, what are some of the activities that uh, businesses can take on today to start getting prepared for what may come later this season? Yeah, the best the best thing to do is just preparation. Um, you know, review 
any of your uh, evacuation, if you're uh, if you're a live event, review your evacuation materials or your uh, protocols for uh, what to do whenever there is a tropical cyclone in the forecast. Uh, even if it's not forecast to to impact your location, it's best to have those uh, materials prepped before time. From an offshore perspective, if you are working one of those offshore platforms, or if you are a helicopter operator, you know, helping with evacuations of the offshore op platforms, uh, go through your preparation materials early. Uh, maybe even conduct some hurricane drills uh, to get that mindset of here are my action steps throughout the process of a tropical cyclone. I've already had conversations with a few of our customers uh, already to who have begun preparing for this upcoming season that, that's a good thing to bring up andrew because i mean it, you know here at dtn we have such vast expertise uh in a lot of these you know safety and uh weather preparedness plans that we can really help out through our risk communication and you know if you want to review those with us i mean like you've done andrew um, a lot of our our partners really find that quite helpful Brad, yeah, one, one of the other things that I thought was really highlighted is that it's not just tropical weather that we're expecting to be active. We've already had an active severe weather season or mentioned drought and heat over across the central and western U.S., so wildfire concerns are there. Um, getting into some of those threats, Brad, and some of the customers you tend to work with in the live event space and other industries, how 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 to handle some of those types of threats versus maybe tropical how does that differ yeah it, it's a lot different because when you're talking about a tropical tropical weather and tropical systems you're talking very much many days in advance planning for a cancellation or a postponement of that event uh so what you're looking at in regards to wildfire or severe weather risks lightning tornadoes what have you that's more of a short term, you know, big evacuation plans. You're looking at, you know, you're trying to mitigate risk, not not just a safety issue, but also your cost. You know, how do you work with your insurers if you have damage? And how do you prepare for, you know, things like, okay, I'm I'm expecting a big flooding heavy rain event. I know I'm gonna have to go spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on, you know, mulch bedding for paths or I need to work on parking lots. I mean, it's a lot of that 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 risk and cost factors really play into some of those short term uh, inclement weather threats. Yeah, one of the interesting data points that Nathan shared was that there was uh, rather Jeff did that was that there was seven. I'm sorry, 80 billion dollars of damage from the hurricane season last year. But that's just the physical damage to assets. There is a a lot more money that is either lost through lost production, um, perhaps a loss of revenue uh, by by having to stop certain activities. Uh, Andrew, when you're working with customers in the offshore space, and this actually ties into some global concerns of, of gas prices right now, um, what are some of the things that uh, we tend to work on with our customers to try to minimize even some of the downstream effects like gas prices that can affect all of us when a tropical system starts to move in. Yeah, the best thing that we do to try to help with our our customers here, especially from an oil and gas production standpoint, is to maximize the, that operating window. The more time you can spend to safely operate uh, when you have an impactful system in the area, the better for everyone, uh, both for our customers and for consumers at large, because that means that there is more supply into the overall environment uh, for those, you know, gas prices at large. Um, and with that, it, it's really focusing on the impacts uh, more than focusing on the track line itself. Uh, that is one thing that is very easy to fall into line is to focus only on the forecast track line of a tropical system. And as we, uh, we as meteorologists all know that that is just the center of the storm. Impacts go well beyond that center of the storm. And that is in the impacts from a wind, a wave perspective, storm surge, rainfall, all of those factors uh, are calculated into that prediction and that forecast as to when we can safely return to operations after an event has occurred. Sure. A lot of, go ahead, Brad. Yeah, I was, I was going to say you talked about the impacts that are, 
from tropical systems that aren't just, you know, confined to coastal areas, right? You're talking about well inland impacts, even after the storm has lost tropical characteristics. One really big example um, that I can bring up is Hurricane Ike. I don't know if you remember that from and it's early September of 2008 um, that, you know, caused extensive damage along the coast, but farther inland, you're talking about wind gusts of 75 plus miles per hour all the way into like Cincinnati and Columbus, much of the Ohio Valley area. And it caused extensive damage, almost derecho like um, high wind event with a lot of power uh, issues and, and damage all the way uh, up through the Ohio Valley, up through New England. So um, it is important to, to you know, understand that, you know, we're not we're not just focusing on impacts along the, um, you know, the the eastern seaboard or the Gulf Coast. It's a lot of these big flooding and high wind impacts can go well inland across the United States. Sure, uh, I will look to answers from both of you on this because you work with sort of different segments of customers and how they prepare. But if you if you were to describe a a high performing company in terms of mitigating weather risk. What are some of the characteristics of of how they've implemented a plan? Um, the types of services that they use that sort of elevate them to be mitigating the risk at a maximum potential. I'll start with you, Brad. Yeah, I think, you know, working with I, from my experience, it's not it's not some of these companies and some of these outdoor you know event organizers and utilities. They don't put things to chance, right? They don't wait until, oh, my weather looks bad. I, I need to, I need weather support and you haven't really prepared for that. They plan, you know, months and years in advance working with, you know, professional, um, you know, weather entities um, like DTN in the private sector to bring in risk communicator meteorologists, all the solutions that we can offer so that we can tell them not only the forecast, I and mean, you can get a forecast anywhere on your app or online, but we can actually tell the for, tell them how it's actually going to impact their operations. So, in the case of utilities, we know okay, you are more susceptible in your infrastructure to coastal flooding or maybe uh, a high you know high wind events in certain areas of your um, of your region. Right, you're going to need to know exactly when those short time periods of greatest weather impacts are going to occur, not only to you know, ensure that you can bring in the right people for overtime, you can get mutual assistance, um, but also save on costs, right? Like I won't need people until it starts here and then you have people in place and you're ready uh, at that time. So some of the best companies, yeah, I've worked with, they, they you know, they're, they work with, uh, you know, professional weather, uh, entities like DTN and and utilize all they can into their safety planning well in advance uh, right. for these big big events. Yeah. Brett, Brett, I would maybe add to that too. If you think um, when you work with a meteorologist, what they'll be able to help you discover is some of the nuances of how even what appear to be minor weather changes can cause major impacts. So I think it's always interesting when we hear from a utility customer how if if you took let's just take an example of 60 mile per hour winds if those winds are coming out of the northwest it may actually not cause disruption to the grid based on mm -hmm. where those assets are set up how the trees are set up vegetation management practices but if the winds out of the south at the exact same speed could be more disruptive to uh the grid as a result of that weather so it's not it's never uh just as obvious as if the wind is this then you cause concern. We're focused right. on trying to really dive into some of those specifics. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, we we have some, um, you know, East Coast utilities where they are a lot more hardy to predominantly westerly or northwesterly winds. Like they've built their infrastructure to handle the those types of events. But maybe those big coastal systems, like the the nor'easters or the big tropical events that bring in more easterly or northeasterly winds, they're not, they're not quite as prepared. So that's where they might have, you know, some of those larger impacts that you're talking talking about. Another application there is in the live event industry. I can think of a few customers that we've worked with in the past where 
uh, they have an amplifier amphitheater that is situated in such a way to where if they have an easterly wind, it doesn't really impact their event too much because they're protected by uh, a mountain range or uh, maybe even like a large hill that is on a certain side of the stage, but they're predominantly susceptible to winds out of, you know, maybe like more of a westerly wind event, uh, just based upon how the stage is situated, or if they have a big video board that is more north south oriented, um, you know, working with a risk communicator can really help hone in on those fine details that uh, could cause more of an impact than just looking at your your phone app to, you know, find what the wind speed might be for a particular day. Yeah, that, the days out, they might decide I, okay, we need to move these video boards or move them to a different direction based on, you know, that wind forecast. So it makes perfect sense. There, there's always, I call it leaky expense that occurs if you don't dive into that detail where, where you haven't totally looked at the all encompassing uh, risk profile from weather. So Andrew, I'll, I'll ask kind of the same question to you when you've worked with your customers. If you said, I'm going to draw the picture perfect customer in mitigating weather risk, what are some activities that you've seen that uh, make a really strong impact. Uh, I yeah, I'll agree with what Brad just said. Uh, it's it's really the development of that weather risk plan and that emergency management plan ahead of time with those risk communicator meteorologists that is that first piece into being a successful, uh, I guess, customer when when compared to someone who you know might have you know incurred more costs than than what could have happened. Um, from a minimization of the, of that risk, and then it goes beyond that too. For you know, throughout the duration of such an event, it is actually putting those action steps that you've planned ahead of time, putting those into action, and acting upon them according to to the plan. And then even after that event, it it could actually be refining those initial plans as well. I, I have found customers who. Um, well, let's just take a tropical cyclone, for example. You know, we went through the procedures and they found, oh, hey, we should fine tune our procedures a little bit more towards this because X, Y, and Z occur with this event. Uh, we can do, you know, this particular thing a little bit better next time to help to maybe maximize for a future event as well. So that it's developing that process and it's always in, in motion. And it's always with that close contact of a risk communicator and a meteorologist in play. Yeah, I love that <clears throat> evaluating performance and essentially what went right, what went wrong. How can we be agile in our uh, development going forward of, of our plans so that when we need to activate them, they are crystal clear and tight. Well, Renny, I mean, I've worked with, you know, a number of large outdoor events on site with, you know, some high profile customers and events and we're constantly every year i you know if we go back to the same place we're constantly evaluating that safety weather action plan so that and even the communication plans and the structure so that we are always improving and not just settling on well this kind of worked well last year and um let's just do that again you know it's always it's always constantly trying to improve absolutely all right, I think that's it for questions for today. I appreciate the discussion, Brad and Andrew, and your insights on uh, some of the steps to take to really mitigate your weather risk and build a plan, act on that plan, and continuously improve. Um, I will turn it now to Andrea to uh, wrap us up today um, and really appreciate everybody's attendance. Thank you so much, Rennie, and thank you, Andrew and Brad, and thank you to our long-range forecasters, uh, Jeff, Nate, and Stephen, uh, for the insightful information about our summer and tropical uh, outlook forecast. I will be sending out an email with the recording and uh, a synopsis report of everything we discussed today in a follow-up email in the next uh, week or so. So thank you, and have a great day. Thank you.